is a whirlwind overview of recombinant protein expression and purification techniques, as well as structural biology techniques. So basically, what do scientists do if they want to study what a protein looks like and how it works? How do they get cells to make or express that protein? How do they purify the protein, so using protein chromatography methods? And then how do they actually use structural biology methods like x-ray crystallography and cryo-EM in order to figure out what the protein looks like. And then how can they do biochemical assays and stuff to figure out how what it looks like corresponds to how it functions. So the connection between form and function, the heart of structural biology. Going back to our central dogma of molecular biology, we know that the instructions for making a protein are written in the form of a DNA gene that then gets transcribed to make a messenger RNA copy that gets translated to make a protein. Because of the universal nature of the genetic code, we can stick that same instructions for that protein into any type of cells and hopefully get them to make the right protein. A little technical detail is that when you go from a um, gene to an RNA, Initially, when you transcribe it, you kind of transcribe a bunch of information that isn't needed by the ribosomes. It's not needed to make the protein. Um, it's extra information like regulatory information, introns, things like this. And so what happens is you get some editing to get a mature messenger RNA. And so what we put into cells, if we want them to get a make, make a protein, is actually a DNA version of this messenger RNA, which we call a cDNA or complementary DNA. We often just refer to this as a gene, but technically it's not a gene, it's a cDNA. We can then stick the cDNA into um, a vector. So a vector is going to serve as a vehicle for getting this, these genetic instructions into cells. Often we're using some sort of plasmid. If we're working with bacteria, we can take a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid and stick it into bacteria, and then bacteria can make the, make the protein for us. We can also use things like bacmids to make baculoviruses for insect cell expression. We can use other types of like adenoviruses and things like this if we want to express in mammalian cells. So there's a bunch of different options depending on what type of cells you're going to actually use. And we'll get into that in a minute, what type of cells, but not the details about how you go about using each of these types. We call this recombinant DNA or protein. Um, basically when we're recombining that cDNA with, that, with the vector, we call this recombinant because we're recombining it. Um, and the way that we recombine it is using molecular cloning strategies. So this can include things like restriction enzymes or PCR-based methods, um, various strategies for this cloning. And so when we're cloning, we talk about cloning um, in biochemistry. We're typically not talking about things like Dolly the sheep. We're just talking about uh, moving pieces of genetic information from one place to another place to do things like make them easier to work with or get cells to make the protein for a protein for us. Speaking of those cells, so I'm not gonna go into the details about how we actually go about using all of these different cell types. I just want you to know that there are different cell types that can be used to express proteins and they have different pros and cons. Um, I want you to be familiar with these so that when they show up in the papers and stuff we're going to read, you'll be, you'll be familiar with them and know why the scientists might've chosen one method or another. Often what you'll see is proteins will be expressed in bacteria. Um, as I mentioned, we can use those plasmids to express things in bacteria. And what's really nice about bacteria is we can actually do like inducible expression, where basically we can get these bacteria to make a protein for us on demand. So if you see a paper when they're talking about like adding IPTG, basically what that's doing is it's going to de-repress the, um, the protein. It's going to make the cells start making that protein on demand. And that, if you're interested in this, I have um, posts on that with much, much more information. Um, I just want you to know that if you come across that, that's probably what it's talking about. So why use bacteria? Well, it's cheap and easy. Um, why not use bacteria? Well, if you're wanting to express like a human protein, these bacteria might not be the best option because they're going to have different post-translational modifications. We often abbreviate these as PTMs. When we talk about PTMs, we might be talking about things like, when we talk about PTMs, we might be talking about things like phosphorylation. So that's the addition of those phosphate groups. Um, glycosylation, 
So that's the addition of sugar chains, um, things like this. They also have different chaperones. So these protein folding helpers. So the proteins might fold differently in the bacterial cells. Um, they might not fold well. Um, the cells might not even want to make you the protein well. Um, and so basically there's different cons. These are often good, often good for small proteins, good for small, simple proteins. But they can have trouble when you're dealing with bigger things or you or you have post-translational modifications you want to care about. In those cases, you might want to choose something that's more um, that's more mammalian-like or human-like or at least more eukaryotic. And so the next um, step up is kind of like yeast cells. These are again going to be cheap and easy-ish, but they have some cons. They're hard to lice, and they're still very different from animal cells. One another method that's commonly used is going to be insect cells or the baculovirus system. So you might see things like SF9, that's a cell line, um, or you might see things like Hi5, see things like SF21. And you don't need to know all these names. Um, just if you if these show up, that's what this is referring to. So I used insect cell expression a lot in my um, grad school days, basically. It's more similar to us in terms of its modifications and chaperones. It's easily manipulatable and it's easiest to scale up, um, but it is a lot of work to maintain and it's more expensive than those bacteria. As to how it works, basically you can use bacteria to make a virus that can only infect insect cells and then you infect those insect cells and get them to make a lot of your protein. So it's a cool system, works well. It's helpful that you can do a lot of the work in the bacteria, but then you have to switch to the insect cells um, and there's a lot of maintenance. Not as much maintenance though as the mammalian cells. So for the mammalian cells, we're dealing with things like um, Cho cells, which I use hamster ovary, um, XB freestyle 293, which are GK cells. These are going to be most similar to humans, so they're going to have similar modifications, similar chaperones, etc. but they're going to be very pricey um, and high maintenance and things like this. Um, and to actually express from those, then you typically have some sort of, um, you have to transfect them with various lipid reagents or use a viral vector system. There's various ways. Um, but basically know that those are going to be the most human-like, the most expensive, um, and that sort of thing. So again, you don't need to know the details of all of these, just when we're doing our paper reading discussions, I want you to be able to, um, to recognize when these show up in your paper so that you're knowing what where to go to find more information, um, but you're not going to be responsible for um, for knowing for knowing the names of all of these different things. This is just for, for the paper discussions things. Another thing that's going to show up in your paper discussions is you might see codon usage optimization. Um, basically, there's different codons, um, basically amino acid, um, the amino acid transfers that come and connect the, read the messenger RNA and bring in the corresponding amino acid. There are multiple ones that can kind of do the same job and the cells might have more than one than the other. And so you can basically, there are strategies to optimize the codon usage for different cell types. Again, you don't need to know the details of all of this, but it is going to show up in some of your papers. And so this is what it's referring to. And then you can go find out more if you're interested. Okay, so whatever the method, you've somehow gotten cells to make your, to make your protein. You can also be purifying protein, like native protein. So protein just out of the, the cells naturally make. And so this is what you'll be doing with your lysozyme. You're going to be purifying it out, purifying the native lysozyme out of the, out of the egg whites. But in most cases, if we want to study a protein, we're doing it this recombinant way. And one of the benefits of this is that we can add a little extra um, protein onto the end that we call a tag, which will help make purification easier. So remember that because we're putting in the genetic instructions, if we add a little bit more DNA on the end, well, now we're going to get a little more protein on the end. And if we get that little more protein on the end, and then we can use that as like an affinity tag, um, basically a way where we can capture the protein, wash everything else away, and then, um, and then elute or push off our protein in a purified form. So 
then what we do is we get these proteins to make, we get the cells to make our protein. We break the cells open. Um, we separate the soluble stuff from the insoluble stuff. And then we can use various forms of protein chromatography in order to purify our protein. Basically with this chromatography, we have these um, columns, which, can, which are filled with these resins, these little beads. And these beads have different properties that are going to interact differently with different proteins. And in this way, we're able to run a solution containing proteins through them. The different proteins will interact differently. So they'll get stuck on the column or they won't get stuck on the column or they'll go slower through the column or they'll go faster through the column. And in this way, we're able to separate proteins to isolate the one that we want. We'll talk a lot more about chromatography in a minute, but first I just want to step back and say something about, um, about one, more, one more detail about the expression and the purification strategy. In most cases, what we're going to be dealing with is we're going to be dealing with water-soluble proteins. But in some cases, including in the examples we're going to use, some of the examples we're going to use, you're dealing with a membrane protein. Now, membrane proteins are more complicated because when you go and you break open those cells, well, the membrane proteins are going to be in with the membrane bits. Um, and so you wouldn't want to then go throw away that pellet and use the supernate and the liquid on top. Instead, what you have to do is you have to actually isolate the proteins from that membrane. One way that is commonly used is to use detergent. So basically the lipid that the membrane proteins are embedded in it had, it's amphiphilic. It has both hydrophilic parts and hydrophobic parts. So it's got hydrophobic tails and hydrophilic heads. And what happens is these phospholipids, they're going to form these bilayer membranes that the protein will be embedded in. Another type of amphiphilic molecule is a detergent, which is basically just an artificial soap. If you add a detergent to water, well, instead of forming those bilayer membranes, it actually forms these like single layer bubble like micelles. Um, and it does this because they have a different shape. So the phospholipids, these are more going to be like rectangular. So they can't form a micelle very easily, but they can form those bilayers. Whereas a detergent, here you're more like conical. And so you can form these micelles. So you can use a detergent because it's still that amphiphilic nature, it can kind of get into, um, wiggle its way into that phospholipid membrane and it will disrupt it. And then if you have enough of the detergent, it will actually um, make micelles that will incorporate, um, incorporate the membrane protein into them. So that's one strategy you can use to actually purify the membrane proteins, the whole length thing um, in their original form. You can also do things like just express parts of it. So basically, if you look at a membrane protein, it often has three different parts for when we're talking about a membrane protein that actually goes all the way through. So when we talk about membrane proteins, we'll see that there's some that go all the way through. There's some that kind of just hang out on one side or the other um, and things like this. We can talk about these proteins as having different domains. So remember our domains are like our rooms in our house. Um, and so basically, there are several different rooms in, in a membrane protein. You can have the ectodomain. And so remember the ectodomain, this is going to be facing the outside of the cell, um, ecto outside. Um, and so then you have the transmembrane domain, the trans through is going through the membrane. And then you have the endodomain. So the part that is actually inside of the cell. Um, so this is going to be inside of the cell and outside of the cell. Now, if you think about what's inside the cell and what's outside the cell, well, outside the here, you're going to have water, a watery environment over here, and then you're going to have a lipid environment in the middle. So the part of the protein that goes through that lipid is going to be hydrophobic, but the parts on the outsides and on the inside um, like of the cell are going to be hydrophilic. When, cell, when proteins are hydrophilic, well, then we can then purify them just like normal pro soluble proteins. So what we can do is because we're actually, um, we can manipulate that DNA sequence, we can manipulate the genetic instructions, we can actually just express those domains separately. So alternative, express only ecto or endo domain. So of course, when you do this, well, now you're losing a lot of the the protein, you're losing a lot of the information. Um, but if you're doing things like studying 
binding to the ecto domain, then this can be an okay strategy in a lot of cases. Okay, so going back to our story, we basically, we're dealing with a recombinant protein. We've stuck it in. We've added a little bit extra onto the end to serve as a tag. And now we're gonna go and purify it. And again, we're gonna purify it using chromatography. So when we do chromatography, you'll see a couple of different um, methods used. So we can either be doing things in like gravity flow. Um, so gravity flow, where you basically pack your own columns. So you fill these columns with resin and there's all sorts of different size columns you can use, or we can use a machine. Um, so commonly this, like, this is like an Acta, that's just like a brand name. Um, and here it's actually going to use pumps to push the liquid through. Um, through the columns. Again, these columns are going to be filled with different types of resin. So this resin, remember these are just like little beads with different features. And so there's kind of like three main types that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about affinity chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, and size exclusion chromatography, which are all going to take advantage of different things about different proteins. Let's take them one by one. With affinity chromatography, we're going to be separating based on a specific feature, such as a tag. With ion exchange chromatography, we're going to be separating based on charge. And with size exclusion chromatography, we're going to be separating proteins based on their size. So we'll go into each of these in a little more detail. Um, but know that often these techniques are kind of done in, um, done in series so that we can get a protein really, really pure. So how many different purification methods you use is going to depend on how pure you need your protein to be. Um, if we're dealing with things like structural biology, where we want really, really pure proteins, then we often do multiple column chromatography um, steps in a row. Often like we'll do affinity chromatography to get rid of most stuff, then ion exchange chromatography, um, and then size exclusion chromatography or gel filtration, and that will get us um, get us hopefully very, very pure protein. But often we'll just be doing, um, for just like the quick and easy, dirt, quick and dirty method, we'll be doing affinity chromatography. And so let's start there. The reason why we want to start with affinity chromatography is basically it's going to be the most specific. So affinity chromatography, what happens here is that your protein has some specific feature that's kind of unique to it. And so most classically, this is going to be a, one, of those, um, one of those protein tags, those affinity tags that we stick onto our protein when we're, when we're doing that recombinant expression, when we're doing that cloning, we just stick a few extra amino acids onto the end, and then we can use resin that has a, um, that has a group attached to it that can actually bind specifically to that specific sequence. So because lots of people put the same specific sequence onto their protein, these companies will then sell this stuff cheaply, where you're or relatively cheaply, still pretty expensive, um, but it's cheaper than having to kind of design something that would bind to every single pro different protein if you can design something to bind to that little tag that people add onto their protein. And so a couple of the common tags are going to be like a his tag or a strep tag. And then these affinity chromatography beads, they'll have kind of like the matching group for that. Now what's gonna happen is when you flow your protein with that tag through the, um, through the column, your protein's gonna stick, but that other stuff is not. And so then you can kind of wash all that other stuff off while your protein is stuck to the column. And then you can add a competitor to kind of um, compete off your protein. So you add something that looks like the tag or the tag itself or whatever, um, and then this will push off the, your protein and allow you to get a pure protein in the absence of all of that stuff that you washed off. So again, a couple examples are a his tag. So a his tag is just six to eight histidines in a row. Um, and it's going to bind metal coated resins. Um, so some often what you'll see is you'll see like nickel NTA um, and things like this. You might also see like talon, which is, I think that's that one is um, cobalt. There's various different metals that are used. And so histidine we'll look at later, it's going to be very good at coordinating metals. Um, and so histidine, if you put a bunch of them in a row, it's going to be able to bind to bind to that column. Then what you do is basically once it's found, then you wash all that other stuff off 
And then you push it off with this, in this case, imidazole, which is going to act as a competitor. And imidazole is basically just that side chain part of histidine. Another one you'll come across is a strep tag. This is going to bind streptactin resin, which is a streptavidin mimic, um, in the same place as biotin and desthiobiotin. So basically what it is, there's a super strong interaction between biotin and avidin, and basically strep or and streptavidin. And so the, the strep tag is basically a biotin mimic that's going to bind to, it, well, I mean, it's obviously biotin is kind of like this um, organic, this small organic molecule, um, and we're dealing with a protein sequence, but they're able to bind to the same um, streptavidin mimic in the same place. And therefore, you can use this streptactin resin, which mimics that streptavidin, in order to bind to a streptagged protein. And then you can compete it off with this thiobiotin. You don't need to know all these details. You just need to know the core idea that you can add an affinity tag to your protein and then use affinity chromatography to specifically capture your protein, wash away the other stuff, and then compete off your protein. Often these affinity tags, they actually, when you put them on your protein, you add a little bit of extra sequence in between the tag and your protein that serves as a protease recognition site sequence. So when we talk about a protease, that's going to be a protein cutter. Some proteases we don't like because they're just gonna chew up our proteins when we're working with them. But these ones are going to be site specific. And so they're going to recognize that specific sequence and then we can cut off our protein. Um, and so, or cut the tag away from our protein. With the, something like a really small tag, you might need not, not need to worry about cutting that tag off because it might not interfere. But sometimes we're dealing with a bigger tag, something like GST, which is actually like a whole protein fused onto the end of your protein. Um, and so this could interfere with further things. And so then you're often going to cut it off. Of course, once you've cut it off, well, now you don't have that specific feature about your protein to take advantage of. So you have to turn to natural properties about the protein. One of the ways that you can do this is ion exchange chromatography because, well, all proteins are gonna have some sort of charge. All proteins have a different combination of amino acids. And as we've seen, different amino acids can have different charges and this will all depend on the pH. So remember that the PI, that's the isoelectric point. That's the point at which a multiprotic molecule is net neutral. And so when we talk about a protein, that is definitely counts as one of those multiprotic molecules. And so it's going to have this PI, this point at which it's net neutral. And why this matters is because, well, if we're at a lower pH than that, remember there's more protons. And so this means that we're gonna have a positive charge overall for our protein. And if we're at a pH that is higher than our PI, well, then our protein is going to be negatively charged. So when you're at a pH that is below the PI, well, then what's gonna happen is your protein is going to be positively charged. But if you're at a pH, that's above the PI, your protein is going to be negatively charged. And well, we know that opposite charges attract one another. So if we have a positively charged protein, we can get it to stick to negatively charged resin. And if we have negatively charged protein, we can get it to stick to positively charged resin. When we talk about something that's positively charged, we're talking about a cation. And when we talk about something that's negatively charged, we're talking about an anion. So what we can do is we can use methods called cation exchange and anion exchange in order to separate proteins based on being positive or negatively charged. If we have a positively charged protein, we're gonna want negative resin. And this is in a strategy called cation exchange. The exchange is because we're going to be exchanging um, salt cations, so like sodium ions for your protein um, and then exchanging back off for salts once again. And so with cation exchange, your protein is cationic. You want the opposite for it, and the resin is going to be negatively charged or anionic. With anion exchange, your protein is anionic, so it's negatively charged, and you're dealing with positively charged resin. In this case, what you're going to be exchanging is going to be exchanging like the chloride ions or whatever the anion is in the salt. Now, what's going to happen is that your protein is going to be able to displace the salt and bind. But if you add more and more salt, well, then your protein is going to get 
um, your protein is going to kind of be competed off similarly to with affinity chromatography, except here we're competing it off with salt molecules. You can also get your protein to come off by changing the charge of the protein, by changing the pH, because remember that the charge is going to be dependent on the pH, but typically we're using salt because, well, if you change the pH, the protein might be mad at you um, and things like this. Often what we're going to do is we're going to use a salt gradient. So when we do it with our lysozyme, we're basically, we're going to be doing ion exchange chromatography, but we're going to be doing it stepwise. Um, so basically go from low salt to really high salt um, um, because it's easier and we don't have to use a machine to do the gradient. Um, but using the gradient is nice because then you can kind of separate things based on their charge rather than kind of, um, I mean, like separate things more granularly based on their charge rather than kind of things that don't bond, things that are not char very charged or in things that are really ch charged or I mean charged in that direction. Um, and so, yeah, so that would be your ion exchange chromatography. Another method that we often use is size exchange chromatography. Um, so this is AKA gel filtration. And so we often also abbreviate this SEC. Um, and basically this is going to separate proteins based on their size. It's often used as a sort of last polishing step. Um, and the way that it works is that instead of things sticking to the beads, the things actually go, your proteins go through and around the beads. So these beads are filled with these little pores, these little like secret tunnels, and there's different sized ones. And the small proteins, well, they're going to get kind of tied up going through all of those little tunnels, but the big ones are not even gonna fit in those tunnels. So they don't, they get to take a shortcut. You can think of it kind of like um, a series of roads and you have little cars and you have big trucks and the big trucks can't go through all of those tunnels. So they get to take shortcuts around them, but the little guys have to go through all those tunnels. And so they're going to take longer to go through the column. And therefore the bigger things are gonna come out first, the smaller things are gonna come out later. There are a ton of different types of columns that we can use um, and they can be filled with different types of resin. They're often like sugar-based or some sort of agarose um, or um, there's some sort of dextrose. There's various ones, stabilized, stabilized sugars. And so you might see things like super dex. You might think, see things like superose. I don't know how you spell that, it might be an O. Um, but anyway, you don't need to know these different names, but if you see something come up like that, that's probably what it's talking about, um, this size exclusion chromatography. Whenever you see a word in a method that you don't know what is, just Google it. Um, and so if you Google it and it'll tell you it's a size exclusion column, and then you're like, oh, I know what size exclusion columns are um, without having to know like, oh, what's superos? Um, so Google is your friend when we're, when we're reading papers, when we're dealing with methods. Um, that's where you're often going to go in order to find the basic information about like what the brand name you're looking at is actually referring to. Um, but then I want you to know basically the idea with size exclusion chromatography is that you're going to be separating proteins based on their size. You might see this in preparative, which is what we've been talking about here, which is when you're actually purifying a protein. Um, people also use it for like analytical purposes where you use a smaller column and you're trying to see if proteins are sticking to one another because if they stick to one another, they're going to be bigger. Um, and so they travel together, they're going to come out sooner. Um, so I think we're going to look at some examples of that as well later. Um, but that would be your size exclusion chromatography. And that's often done as a polishing step for structural biology purposes. So structural biology is the field of biology that explores the interplay between biomolecular form and function. So remember, we've been talking lots and lots about how the protein sequence is going to determine how the protein folds, and that's going to determine how it functions. And oops, this is one of my old figures where I have it, the amino acid not drawn in its Witter ionic form. I always wanted you to see, I always want you guys to draw in your in this Witter ionic form. See, even teachers mess up, but that should be in this Witter ionic form. Um, because remember that non-ionic form is really non-existent. Um, so you should also have you should have that negative charge on your CO minus and the positive charge on your um amino and terminal amino amino, amino group. Okay, so basically structural biology, we're gonna explore the connection between that form and that function. And often what we're going to do is we're going to look at the, look at the form, look at its structure um, with techniques like exocrystallography, cryo-EM, NMR, 
Um, and then we can kind of combine that with binding assays, activity assays, various things to kind of test the function of these molecules. And then we can make changes to the protein, um, or we can study changes that were naturally made, like mutations that have happened, maybe mutations that cause disease. And so that's going to be what you're going to be doing with your papers, is looking at how mutations in various proteins can cause these metabolic disorders. Um, and often scientists will like want to look at the structure, want to do experiments in the lab, kind of try to connect the two. And remember that because we can manipulate the sequence when we're doing that recombinant expression, we can do things like introduce those specific mutations or introduce new mutations, um, study domains in isolation, all of those various things because of that recombinant technology that we can basically get cells to make any version of a protein that we want. So we talked about that stuff, but now let's talk about how we actually go and look at its structure. So first off, what do we mean by when we say like solve a structure? Basically it just means we want to like figure out how a molecule's atoms are arranged in 3D. So remember our primary sequence, that's just our sequence of amino acids. And so basically we can draw a long chain. We can say, okay, well, we've got all these peptide bonds and stuff like this. We know how, which atom is connected to which atom, but that's not going to tell us how they're actually going to be folded up in 3D. And so we want to go and say, okay, well, how are they folded up in 3D? What is our secondary structure and our tertiary structure and maybe even our quaternary structure? We can use this using, um, using structural biology methods. So the main structural biology techniques we're talking about, we're talking about X-ray crystallography. Um, this has kind of been the conventional workhorse of structural biology. Lately, there's been a revolution in cryogenic electron microscopy, or cryoEM. Um, it's been like this revolution. There's been a bunch of advancements in the technology. Originally, it was only good for like really big things, but they're starting to get down where it's also um, being able to be used for smaller protein structures, as well as structures of complexes and things like this. Um, so we'll go into a little more in detail, but still just at the very um, lowest level, there's lots, lots more detail, um, but basically we'll take a look at these different techniques. Um, but first, there's also a couple more. One is nuclear magnetic resonance. Or NMR. abbreviated NMR, um, which is good for small, little, little small flexible things. And then there's going to be kind of um, computational methods. So you're gonna see things like alpha fold, Rosetta fold, et cetera. And so we're talking about like AI, machine learning, all this various things. Um, there's also like molecular dynamics and things like this. So lots of different techniques that you can do on the computational side. Um, but then these, you have these, which are going to be um, experimentally determined. And so that's gonna be like actual wet work. Okay. So those two main ones that you'll see these days are going to be X-ray crystallography and single particle cryo-EM. So we're distinguishing single particle. Um, when we talk about a particle, basically that's just like, that could be your protein, that could be a protein complex. It's the thing that you want to, you're trying to get a look at. Um, and so there's also methods like um, for, for electron microscopy that are not single particle, that are basically looking at like topog tomography or basically like slices of cells, um, things like that. There's some really cool stuff going on in those fields, but we're gonna be focusing mostly on the single particle. The basic idea is that with X-ray crystallography, what you're doing is you take a protein and you get it to kind of crystallize. And this is a lot harder than it sounds. And basically um, what it means though is that all the protein copies are going to kind of line themselves up in an orderly array. 
So if you think about like a salt and a salt lattice, how everything's kind of interconnected in the same orientation throughout, you get the same thing happening, but with a protein. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna shoot x-rays at it and those x-rays are going to interact with the electrons in the, in the protein or whatever other molecule you're working with. And then those interactive waves, they're kind of gonna get scattered. Those scattered waves are going to interfere with one another. Um, think of dropping a golf ball into a swimming pool and all those like little ripple waves on um, how they interact with one another. The same thing is happening here, but we're dealing with x-rays. And then they're going to go hit a detector. When they hit a detector, they're going to get a pattern of make a pattern of spots called the diffraction pattern. And then scientists can work backwards from this pattern in order to figure out the structure of the molecule. So I did some of this in my grad school days, um, and it can be really cool, but it can also be really frustrating when your protein doesn't want to crystallize for you. So you have to try out lots and lots of different, lots and lots of different um, conditions. What about cryo-EM? Well, with cryo-EM here, basically, you're kind of, it's more like taking pictures but you really, really fuzzy ones. And so you can't just take a picture of a single molecule. That wouldn't be very helpful. It would just be like a fuzzy, fuzzy thing. So instead, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take lots and lots and lots of pictures of the molecule. And what's nice about cryo-EM is you don't need to get it to um, like crystallize. You are gonna freeze it in place, but not, you're not making it kind of freeze. You're basically freezing it by, by literally freezing it or at least vitrifying it. So basically you get it super, super cooled in a really thin layer of um, thin layer of water that serves as like this glass. And then what's gonna happen is that your proteins are kind of gonna get stuck in place wherever they are. So they're going to be moving around randomly and they're going to be kind of like, so you might see some like laying down or standing up or things like this. And then what's gonna happen is that they're just gonna kind of get stuck in the position that they were in rather than crystallography where they get stuck in that position that's going to be the same throughout the crystal. Now what's gonna happen is you're gonna take lots and lots of pictures of these using electron beams. And so because they're so tiny, we're gonna be using um, electron waves instead of light waves because light waves aren't going to be small enough. Um, so we're going to use these electron light waves and we're going to focus them um, by, by um, electromagnetic lenses. And then they're going to hit a detector. And then there's a bunch of computational stuff that will give us those fuzzy pictures. We get fuzzy pictures of the protein in all sorts of different orientations and we kind of average them together. So we'll say, okay, well, those ones all look like they're laying down and these ones all look like they're standing up. And so let's put these together. And then, okay, well, now we have the same thing in different positions, so we can average those all together. We can use them to make a 3D model, similarly to, um, say, if you were doing an MRI or something like this, um, where they take different slices and then they kind of like work backwards to piece the 3D thing together. And then you're able to figure out what the structure is based on averaging together all those fuzzy images. You can also, with cryo-EM, because they're kind of can be in different, things can be in different conformations as well, and sometimes you can um, see those too. So for example, you might see someone sitting instead of standing or laying. And when they're sitting, well, then they're in a different shape. And so if you can isolate, like, okay, well, we have ones that are sitting and we'll isolate those. Um, and then we have ones where you can see the back of the person sitting, ones you can see the front of the person sit sitting. We can average all of those together. So basically with cryo-EM, there's ways to see different orientations of molecules, like different conformations of molecules, as well as just being able to average together all of those different um, kind of like orientations of the same, of the same conformation. Bottom line, you need a lot, a lot, a lot of data. Um, you average them all together and you can get a structure. But it's not as easy as it sounds. And with any of these techniques, when we're talking about cryo-EM, when we're talking about crystallography, what we're getting is actually not, we don't get the positions of the atoms directly. Instead, we just get the evidence that they were there. So when we're dealing with crystallography, we're dealing with kind of like evidence of where the electrons were. Um, and so when we're dealing with, um, when we're dealing with cryo-EM, um, then we're dealing with like, Technically, we're dealing with like Coulomb potential. Um, anyway, you get this like fuzzy looking kind of map thing. And then the scientists have to go and kind of model things into those maps.
So when we go and we look at structures, what we're looking at is actually a structural model where they're modeling in the positions of the atoms into that data. And so we'll look at how we can actually go and explore these models ourselves. The easier, the higher the resolution of the data, kind of like the less fuzzy it is, and the crisper the, um, the, crisper the maps are gonna be, the easier it is to fit in the model. So when we talk about resolution, a high resolution is going to have little numbers. So high resolution, little numbers. Low resolution, high numbers. High resolution is going to be good. Low resolution is going to be bad, which you can probably um, guess based on if you think about a high res TV versus a low res TV, you want that high res, right? Well, resolution is referring to how close two things can be while well, you can still kind of like tell the two different things. And so the smaller the number, the um, the closer things can be where well, you can still tell them apart. So it's like if you have two dots far away, can you tell that they're two dots or do they just look like one dot? Um, and basically the better your eyesight, the closer those dots can be and you can still see that they're two different things. So similarly, the higher the resolution of our data, the more easy, the easier we can kind of say, okay, well, yes, this is there's an atom here, there's an atom here, there's an atom here, versus oh, there's some sort of sausagey thing we'll have to fit things into. Um, so that's what you'll see when we talk about resolution, and we're typically dealing in terms of angstrom, which remember is a point one of nanometers. What's really great about structural biology for the outsider is that all of the structures and the experimental data behind them, like their maps and stuff, have to be deposited so that anybody can go and look at them. And they get deposited into this thing called the protein data bank or the PDB. You can find all sorts of information about how the scientists solved it. You can actually go and explore the structure. You can check out different features about it. And so we'll be looking at the PDB and they have some great educational resources. So check out um, PDB 101 for more, for more info on it, on how to use the PDB, as well as more info on structural biology. Another technique is nuclear magnetic resonance. So this is going to be good for small, flexible. What happens with structural, with um, crystallography and with cryo-EM is that basically there can be regions of the protein that don't resolve. So you don't actually get maps for those regions. The part of the protein is actually there, but the data is too fuzzy. So you can kind of think of it all averaging out. Um, it's all blurring each other out, canceling each other out. And so you're not going to see those regions that are flexible. But with, a, with NMR here, it can actually use those flexible regions, but it only can do deal, deal with small things, um, but they're going to be like randomly moving around and what you actually get is some sort of ensemble. And so you can check out the video if you want to learn more about this, the PDB has a little video explaining it, um, but we don't need to worry about NMR um, for the purposes of our class. Um, the other thing you'll hear a lot about is like these AI and machine learning various ways to predict structures. And you'll actually see that in Uniprot, so it's going to be the protein database we'll look at. Um, basically there, you can actually see predicted structures as well. Um, so there are limitations, like if you want to look at complexes, if you want to look at regions of proteins that don't have structures that are like known structures kind of, or regions that are kind of um, more flexible, if you want to look at modifications, there's various limitations to these prediction mod algorithms, but they often can be helpful for structural biologists to kind of like get an idea of what a protein looks like and maybe even use it to help make their models. So there's various things like this um, that you'll probably hear about lots. So that's a basic idea. We can basically get cells to make a protein for us using recombinant expression techniques. Then we can break those cells open and then we can take a mixture that was from the broken open cells and we can use protein chromatography to separate the proteins in that mixture based on how they do or don't interact with various resin. Um, so these little beads that we have in these columns. Then scientists can use structural biology techniques if they want to go and take a look at it. They can also use um, biochemical assays and things like this to study the functions of the proteins that they purified.